Obviously, the main job that we have as an optimizer is to maximize earnings potential of the assets under our management, but that earnings potential differs. How do you decide what markets put your battery in? And when do you do that? That is the million dollar question of it. <laughs> it so it's really the flexibility of not having that to tell them an hour ahead of time. Do you think that's what's driving most of that decisioning? Because it's very risky, right? That non-BM strategy. It can be. You're dealing with the last available market, pretty much. It's the market of last resort. So if I, and you wouldn't think it would boil down to like the day-to-day -day decision making of, of a storage operator, mm. or storage optimizer making sort of one hour, two hour spread trades. But it really does because you need to know that as new markets come to the fore, as we start to trade further out on the curve and we, and we start to see more liquidity of like these hitherto illiquid products as a result of the fact that the GB best market is growing exponentially. Hello everybody, welcome back to Modo the podcast for our second installment in our mini series focusing on battery energy storage and energy markets in Great Britain. This instalment is guest hosted by Robin and she's chatting to Chris McLeod, Head of Trading at Habitat Energy. As always, if you're enjoying the podcast, please give it a like and hit subscribe. It really means the world to us. And if you're enjoying the content, head over to Modo Energy on LinkedIn. Let's jump in. Hello everybody, welcome to the Modo podcast. For those of you expecting the dulcet tones of Quentin, I'm afraid you've got the dulcet tones of Robin instead. I'm here joined by Chris McLeod from Habitat Energy and we are gonna talk about the role of the optimizer in the GB market right now. So Chris, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Maybe you could start off with telling us a little bit about you, who you are and how you got here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Robin. I've been wanting to come on the show for a while and uh, avidly listen to the podcast. So it's very nice to be here in, in person. Good to have you. It's been a while since we've had the the optimizer on the other side of this table. So it'd be good so. to get like a latest view of what's happening in the market from and your I, perspective. And I'd love to give it. So yeah, thank you for introducing me. Yeah, Chris McLeod. I'm the head of trading at Habitat Energy. Formerly, I've been in the industry for about 10 years or so now. Before Habitat, I was a power trader at Centrica Energy Marketing and Trading, where I was mostly trading a large thermal portfolio of gas power stations. Uh, so it's been a bit of a seismic shift going <laughs> from sort of a three gigawatt portfolio of CCGTs to a itty bitty but vastly growing portfolio of battery storage. So how big was the Habitat portfolio when you joined compared to now? Technically zero because we didn't have any commercial contracts. So I, I joined in, in 2019. We were piloting our software. So we, we were founded in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we spent our sort of early years just building up that software base and our optimiza optimization algorithms. Uh, and so when I joined, we were uh, we found a couple of uh, friendly uh, generators who were willing to loan us their sites to test our sort of trading algorithms. Uh, and that gave us a real wealth of, uh, of information. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically from that point, myself and, and Ellie, who is our uh, operations director, basically built up our trading capability. And so in, two, in January 2020, we uh, signed our first commercial contracts with Gresham House and have been optimizing uh, assets since then. Awesome. So how many, should we talk about Braggawatts? How many Braggawatts are you at now? <laughs> yeah, we can talk about Braggawatts, sure. It's been uh, slow and steady progress. So currently our operational portfolio is about 360 megawatts and about 410 megawatt hours. So average portfolio duration is about 1.2 hours. Uh, but within that, we've got a real range of, of asset sizes. So we've got some old uh, XEFR sites that are about 30, 40 minutes. And then we've got some longer duration, one and a half hour sites. Uh, we're soon to get our first two hour duration site, which is going to be very exciting. Awesome. And in terms of pipeline, uh, operational and under contract, we've, uh, we're at 950. So pushing the the big one gigawatt. Really? Have a gigawatt party when we, you get there. I think we definitely <laughs> should have a gigawatt party. Yeah. So to put that in perspective, that's roughly 10% ish, just over of the of the UK fleet right now, mm -hmm. under Habitat operation. Awesome. So within that portfolio, there's obviously quite a lot of diversity. If you've got your old EFR assets that are pretty short duration in comparison to say the new ones that are two hours coming online, 
is that difficult to manage when you've got a lot of difference within the portfolio using things like automated software? It is challenging in order to, obviously, the main job that we have as an optimizer is to maximize the earnings potential of the assets under our management. But that earnings potential differs depending on the type of technology, the duration, how old it is, how much it's degraded, what its warranty looks like. Mm -hmm. And so all of those decisions and considerations have to come into play when you're deciding which market to operate the site in. Yeah, I guess that's a nice leeway to kind of talk about the markets for batteries at the moment. Maybe you could give us like a, a quick overview of what all the different acronyms mean right now. Uh, and I know it's an ever-changing picture. Right. Yeah, there are quite a lot of markets that batteries can participate in. I guess if I was to boil it down, I'd say they they largely look, there are response markets, there's energy trading, there are reserve markets and there are stability markets. And okay, let's... Potentially a lot of a lot of different uh, ways of trading within those. And some are more of a of a proper market or a more liquid market than than others. More of like a functioning economic market. Than exactly, others. exactly. So response. What does response mean? Response is it's been around for a while. In fact, if you're transmission connected in uh, GB, you have to provide mandatory frequency response. Mm -hmm. And it's a way for the system operator to control the the system frequency. So. Uh, in GB, we have a 50 hertz system. In the US, it's 60 hertz. So response is a thing that's keeping frequency ticking over exactly. close to its exactly. operational. Because National Grid has to balance supply and demand in real time, it's trying to keep that system frequency nice and stable at 50 hertz. So and these are ones like FFR, mm -hmm. DC, DRDM. Those all come under this umbrella of response. If we talk quickly about reserve, because that's maybe something people are less familiar with? Are there any like functioning markets for reserve that um, your assets participate in? I think it's going to be quite interesting going forward, mm. looking at some of the new reserve markets. So we've got a quick reserve, slow reserve, balancing reserve. So these are when batteries will discharge over a slightly longer period. So rather than those like sub second response times for response, we're looking at it's kind of the next thing that National Grid have in their arsenal to balance supply and demand. That's it. National Grid are, are having to look at, they're, they're looking at their demand forecast, they're looking at their renewables generation forecast, and, and they're looking at what the largest loss of load is, and they're trying to make sure that they've got adequate headroom and foot room for any point in time to be able to manage that. The, I think the problem is that batteries, because they are so quick at responding, have historically provided this reserve for free. Yeah. Now, it's something they're very good at doing. We've had the reserve from storage trials, which we participated in, which proved that batteries could do this and they could do it quite competitively and at a lower cost to the end consumer. But in practice, on those scarce days, National Grid tends to go to established generators, also generators whose dynamics are not as quick. And they have to do that uh, in order to secure, make sure that that reserve is there. And unfortunately, what that tends to mean is that at the point where that reserve would otherwise be needed, there is maybe no longer a requirement. And so batteries have kind of given that reserve for free. Mm. And so the way in which we can get around that is by having you know multiple frequent auctions, transparent auctions, competitive auctions, with which uh, battery assets can be paid an availability fee. And we think that we'll we'll see those with the quick reserve and the slow reserve products um, that are coming down the line. Believe so, yeah. I think it was due to be sort of end of this year. It's been pushed out, but uh, I think that is going to be an interesting new marketplace yeah, for, for sure. batteries to participate. And then the final one was talking about stability. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the stability markets, so stability is things like synthetic inertia, uh, voltage control and, and, and reactive power provision, um, black start, uh, short circuit, a lot, of, a, a lot of buzzwords. Most of these are being looked at at the moment through Pathfinder. So these are pretty locational contracts mm -hmm. usually where the grid is particularly constrained or grid need to procure a particular service. So they're not kind of something you would look to participate in at like the day ahead basis is not part of your it, consideration. It's, it's not, it's, yeah, it's, it's exactly that. It's not part of your day to day uh, optimization uh, decision making. But this is what National Grid tends to do in terms of it gets a lot of learning from these Pathfinder projects. Assets get 
revenue certainty and they get built. This is exactly what happened with the first uh, FFR contracts and importantly EFR in, in mm. 2016 yeah. that had about 200 megawatts of assets built off of the back of that and really kick-started the, the battery industry. So it's foreseeable that these will become more functioning marketplaces going forwards and in the future. But today, right here and now, it's mostly the uh, new suite of response services mm -hmm. and energy trading that makes up the bulk of battery revenues. Awesome. Thank you for that. So looping back around to those kind of real time markets that are probably more efficient markets. How do you decide what markets put your battery in and when do you do that? Uh, that is the million dollar question <laughs> of it. It's the answer is quite complicated because there's a number of different markets and time horizons that we can operate in. Uh, fundamentally, we're operating an energy limited uh, asset class. So mm -hmm. batteries are durationally limited. And as a result of that, if it's dependent on whether you are marketing your flexibility for uh, an ancillary service where you're paid on your power and you're paid an availability fee, or depending on whether you're looking at uh, using that intrinsic value of, you, of your battery and, and what people commonly refer to as time shifting, buying in the lowest so price periods, holding on to that until your forecasts point to a more optimal period where you can obtain a higher price and you discharge the battery. So charging up in the middle of the day when there's lots of solar spilling onto the system, exactly. maybe prices even go negative, yep. discharging later on. And how do you make that decision between, say, a day ahead, going into one of the response markets, DC, DM, or holding back that flexibility and, and trying to sell it intraday or day ahead on those those wholesale markets? The short answer is that ultimately it depends on the quality of your forecasts. So we process a wide variety of data, system data, market data, uh, weather data, and we have to, and we use that to formulate price forecasts for the various markets in which we operate in. So a bunch of super clever machine learning algorithms they're um, constantly sort of refining their predictions to give you the best the best uh, success, meaning the most money for your asset. That's it. It's, uh, it's actually a combination of forecasts. So what we, we do at Habitat is we try and have for, for every machine learning model that we've got, we, it's also backed by a, a fundamental model or a more rules based explicit. Model. OK. And not only does this give the trader, this allows the traders to play the two forecasts against each other, see where one's performing well. Obviously, if both forecasts are pointing in the same direction, that should give you a lot of confidence as a trader. But it also allows us to continually refine uh, the ML models based on what we're seeing uh, from the, the fundamental ones as well. Yeah, yeah. Nice to have the complement of the two. One of the issues with developing lots of machine learning forecasts in this space is the past doesn't necessarily look that much like the future. So you have to be quite careful how you train those models. I guess one of the things I'm kind of interested in unpacking is at Habitat, how you blend having the traders that you have mm -hmm. with, you know, those decisions that the algorithms might suggest. Is it is it quite clear cut or you know, how has that kind of journey changed over time with using humans versus computers? It's not always clear cut. No, in fact, it's 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 quite it's quite a difficult one to unpack. We have, I think, when we were first founded, uh, we were founded with the belief that you know, the ancillary markets, uh, whilst they've been the mainstay of battery revenues, and indeed in recent years they've been a boon for batteries, um, they're inherently shallow markets, mm -hmm. right? They're prone to saturation. National Grid's got a finite requirement for it. We're already at almost, I think, three gigawatts of installed capacity. Yeah in the GB. Very and much saturated. We've probably of, got like months ago. maybe two, two and a half gigs of uh, maximum procurement of the response services. So when we were founded, we, the, we knew that the long term revenue source for batteries would be in the wholesale markets. Yep. These are the, your deep liquid markets. The fact that uh, in most cases, energy can't be stored means that it needs to be used in real time, means that its value is dictated by what people will pay for it in real time and, and that balance between supply and demand. So having the right tools to be able to forecast that across markets, so the main wholesale markets in, in GB, you've obviously got the curve and forward markets, but a lot of these are, you know, the further out you go in time, the, the more illiquid they come. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily the type of products that battery storage would be looking at act, uh, uh, executing on. These are base load contracts, peak contracts, whereas we're looking at sort of one, two hour spreads. Yep. 
But as you get closer to real time, you get more granularity mm -hmm. in those products, more liquidity as, as people get more confidence, the, the weather models get better, the demand yeah. models get better. Uh, and ultimately, you've got the day ahead auctions themselves, which uh, they're very, they're very liquid. Uh, they're quite predictable in terms of the, the price tends to follow the demand shape, but they don't necessarily always guarantee you the best price. And in fact, some of the, the most volatility is seen in the intraday and balancing and, and real time markets, the system imbalance price. Right. So we've got that kind of fairly predictable day ahead price shape. And then if you go closer and closer to real time, as your wind forecast essentially gets better and better and better, where you're, you've got a shortfall or a longfall, that mm -hmm. has a much bigger effect on the volatility, the volatility of that price, which is essentially what you're trying to capture with batteries. Yeah. So having the the models and the forecasts that point to what is what's my expected range of outturns, because actually there's not just a single. You might have a central case, mm -hmm. you might have like a, a a mean value, but there are there's so many factors in terms of like the day-to-day -day running of the GB system, which can influence the imbalance on the system and therefore the uh, eventual price. And you've got all of these market participants that are betting on that price. You've got generators, you've got utilities, you've got proprietary traders, and they're all taking views and bets on uh, how National Grid is going to balance the system. Which in turn can then flip the system the other way, which makes it... If they, it's yeah, slightly more complicated. If they are, sometimes. Yeah, exactly, and that that can happen sometimes. Like particularly if you've got and more and more battery storage. Importantly, more and more sort of non BM uh, yeah, we're gonna, battery we're, storage. We'll dig into this because there are two types of, of batteries on the system. If you ignore things like age and duration, there are those registered for the balancing mechanism, mm -hmm. and this is when you tell National Grid what you're going to do ahead of time, and they use that information to balance the system. And then, and you know, there's quite a lot of red tape in getting into the BM. It can take a while. We've got a whole thing about battery skip rates, which we'll come on to. And then there's the non-BM units, which can follow a strategy that we call NIV chasing. That is net imbalance volume. So when that system flips from long to short, and Habitat do very well with their non-BM registered assets. And we've seen a number of big sites actually turn from BM into non-BM. And so, yeah, really keen to hear how you like assess the probabilities and forecast that though, those imbalanced positions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that was an excellent summary of the, the, the main distinctions between the two there. So our, of our current portfolio, we've got about 15 assets. Two of them, Red Sky and Cowley, are both BM registered. The, the rest are all... Oh, I didn't realise it was such a big, big difference. I know. Portfolio. The next tranche of uh, sites that we onboard, uh, a lot of them are going to be BM registered. And that's, I think, you know, the owners taking bets on the market becoming more efficient. Mm. And, it, and it should be, you know, batteries are like really well placed to provide uh, fast response in the balancing mechanism should they be called on. And they can do it more competitively than uh, other technology types. And with less carbon emitted. And importantly, with less carbon emitted, exactly. So that said, why why has, isn't more of your portfolio in the BM right now? Um, I think it's in part due to, so as, as you said, you've got these non-BM registered sites and the important distinction between BM and non-BM is that these, these non-BM sites, they don't get to participate in the balancing mechanism. So the balancing mechanism is where you as a, as a generator can provide the system operator with prices at which they can utilize your flexibility. So for a battery, that's both upwards and downwards. Mm -hmm. And that's great because what that you can potentially get taken at a price that's not seen in the, in the wholesale markets, in the traded markets. So it's, and, and you've potentially got much bigger uh, spreads. Exactly. You can, well, you can get paid to charge more often than you might in those wholesale markets exactly for example. but the the caveat of that is that in order to participate you have to uh tell the system operator of your intended dispatch dispatch profile via your physical notification an hour ahead of real time and then you can't deviate from that if you deviate from that it means that your asset isn't performing as it should and you should show that through your mel and mill yeah if, if all of the balancing mechanism registered units didn't do what they said they were going to do or then we would be in trouble as a system i think so N national grid are very good at balancing the system in fact i think the last time we saw a blackout was august 2018 when system frequency went away from where it should have 
Uh, and that was a you know one of those freak events. I think that was an unplanned trip of that was both, lightning hitting that, some cable that was a, tripped a an wind offshore wind farm. Wind farm I think CCGT. Horn C two and uh, a medium sized CCGT Little Barford both tripping within seconds of each yeah. other and then taking off a bunch of embedded generation in the process. So that's the thing that we're trying to avoid in all in all of this. That that left people stranded on the tube. Uh, that was brought up in Prime Minister's <laughs> questions. That's what National Grid wants to. That was a strange time avoid. hearing about frequency response on the radio and reading it in the paper. It's like, <laughs> exactly. Oh, my little world has suddenly been exposed. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to go back to your point around like what what are those differences? Why why is so much of our portfolio currently non BM? Um, whilst these non BM sites they can't participate in the balancing mechanism, neither do they have to tell National Grid of intended. So it's really the flexibility of not having that to tell them an hour ahead of time? Do you think that's what's driving most of that decisioning? They are much more flexible. So as a result, they are better able to capture the imbalance spread. So that's the, you mentioned NIV, net imbalance volume. Uh, the imbalance price is dictated by the, the marginal one megawatt hour or the price average reference, as it's also called, uh, of Anyone of balancing capacity. Anyone who's delved into the BSC code will have, <laughs> have fun figuring out exactly how the, uh, the system price is calculated. But yeah, so they, they essentially access the flip side of the BM by chasing if a system is long or short. And that turns out to be a more profitable, because it's very risky, right? That non-BM strategy. Yeah, it, it, it can be. So you're dealing with the last available market, pretty much. It's the market of last resort. So if I choose to dispatch my battery and I don't contract it in a prior wholesale market, I get the imbalance price. I pay or receive that price. And that can be beneficial to you, and that's the whole point of NIV chasing, if you can predict the direction and importantly the, the price of, of like how National Grid is going to balance that period of time. But in doing so, you've potentially foregone a bunch of other markets that mm. have come ahead of you. Um, you have to price, you have to be quite confident with how you're pricing that opportunity. Exactly. That's, so we go back to quality so, of your So then forecast. we go back to those forecasts. Fun. So it sounds like all of the data scientists have had Habitat have got their work cut out. <laughs> Ab absolutely. No, definitely hold them to account. <laughs> awesome. So how do you think the market has changed since you've been at Habitat? So if we go back to kind of 2019, 2020 with the first commercial assets, we're very much kind of <laughs> DC, FFR, whereas now those markets are saturated. That must be, it's quite a journey to have been on as a trader. Uh yeah, that's one way. That's one way of putting it. I think if I had one word to explain it, it would be probably saturation. If I had two words, I'd say volatility and saturation. Mm. We've gone through an, an unprecedented time in both the the GB power markets, but also like across Europe. So we've gone through a couple of very tight winters. We've obviously had uh, we've we've gone through COVID and the very low demand mm -hmm. periods of time where National Grid had to bring on new services like uh, ODFM optional. Uh, downward, downward flexibility, flexibility management, yep. yeah, where they had to find a, quickly find a way of turning off renewables uh, to, to to balance uh, a, a GB that was uh, using a lot less demand than previously ever. It's very ever windy and possible. very sunny and that very little well. demand, yeah. Yeah, and then we've gone through a period of like fairly dramatic uncertainty in the gas markets sparked by the Russia Ukraine crisis, and that's led to some like historically unprecedented levels of price volatility and we just have to look at uh last winter going into this first quarter of this year and where the forward markets were predicting prices to be at and some of the levels that so the, the scarcity premium that people were uh pricing into those forward markets were uh were they were huge they were huge they were they were based on the fact that we weren't going to have enough we, we genuinely thought there might be blackouts last week. We were going to have to compete with France and yeah. France had all of their nuclear problems yeah. uh, and National Grid was going to have to run everything in its arsenal at new uh, yeah. prices, £6,000 per megawatt hour, which we did see on the 12th of December last year. Uh, didn't set the imbalance price, but we did see units run at that. So it was well founded, that risk, but mm -hmm. ultimately uh, we had a much milder winter than forecast. And all of the EU-wide response to uh, basically wean ourselves off of a dependence on Russian gas meant that uh, gas storage inventories going into winter were fullest they've ever been. And then because of the mild winter, we've actually not drawn down on them by nearly as much. So because we've not had a whole a heap of renewables volatility either, 
more often than not, the the marginal price and be that in the day ahead power auctions or or in balance in real time is being set by CCTTs in a now depressed gas market. So and that's why we've seen we're near those volatility those gone, daily well, spreads. We've gone from massive massive spreads mm. uh, to uh, spreads reminiscent of sort of twenty twenty again. It's very difficult to forecast when you've got such scarcity pricing. And I think that is why we have what we call at Habitat, this human in the loop as well. Mm. So we put a great reliance in our forecast and our optimization algorithms, but we also have a really uh, savvy commercial team, which I have the pleasure of managing, uh, that are overseeing that and making those valued decisions. And so I don't think we'd have been uh, nearly as successful as we have been without that. You know, we, you can't predict something you've never seen before. Yeah. And so uh, Epex, the European Power Exchange, had to increase the market cap after 2021, where the, the previous intraday uh, price cap was £3,000. There were units running at £4,000 in the balancing mechanism. And for the first time ever, and I've never seen this in my, my entire trading career, there was people clamoring to buy on the bid side at £3,000 and no one willing to sell on the offer side because in balance they couldn't sell at a market reflected price because offer offer prices in the in the BM and the imbalance price was likely going to be a thousand pounds higher. And as a result of that, National Grid had to increase the market cap. So it's now six thousand pounds. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's that's crazy to think to think back of when you're in very calm times that that that's that's and it's where a things complete were reversal, going. reversal from where we see ourselves now. But I think it's that kind of systemic volatility structurally things aren't things are unchanged i think we still have we still have got a very dependent uh gb system and european system on weather patterns mm -hmm. on now global lng flows more than anything mm -hmm. i mean i think last week we just saw a 25 percent hike in ttf and mbp gas as a result of uh threatened strike action in australia yep <laughs> so we're now competing with asia for our you know it's quite a gas different now dynamics global market. for all of all of the uk power traders to get them heads heads around really and you wouldn't think it would boil down to like the the day to day decision making of of a storage operator mm. or a storage optimizer making sort of one hour two hour spread trades, but it really does because you need to know like as new markets come to the fore, as we start to trade further out on the curve, and we and we start to see more liquidity of like these hitherto illiquid products as a result of the fact that the GB best market is growing exponentially. Yeah, this was, I was going to come around to this. So we, we when we talk about batteries, as, as we've been discussing, it's really usually about day ahead, intraday, the BM or NIV chasing. But there's this whole other part of the electricity market, which we don't really talk about, which is the forwards markets. And I know we've touched on that. Do you see that there will be more kind of traded products over a shorter period of time? So maybe one hour or two hours, half an EVA block, which would be more suited to batteries going out further? Or do you have any kind of uh, forward trades that are specifically like quite different from the, the market traded products? I think unquestionably, think this is unquestionably yes. Thing? I think this is really going to grow going forwards. The, the market needs liquidity providers. And so with you know we've got three gigawatts of best now i think there's 25 gigawatts planned by 2030 um, there's going to be a lot of new flexible assets that are looking for new ways to monetize uh, and lock in both the intrinsic and ex extrinsic value mm -hmm. of, of these what are essentially physical options that means that there's going to be new sources of liquidity in the market there's going to be more people willing to offer it. So we've set ourselves up to be able to do this as well, seeing the future and seeing the the, the market need for this. Um, there's not a lot going on at the moment, I don't think. And if you indeed, if you look at the forward curve for this winter, uh, there's not a lot of of, of value there the, for, the for storage. The volatility just isn't there right now. Exactly, exactly. You had locked that in sort of December last, last year when exactly. you had intrinsic for, for Q, like 500 pounds spread. You won of this year. Yeah, you would have been laughing your way to the bank. So I think that is absolutely going to grow and it's going to become a requirement for asset owners mm. of, of their optimizers to be able to, to access these markets in yeah. the same way that uh, you need to be able to access dynamic containment and the and the wholesale markets today. Do you think that's got a different set of challenges for optimizers to get their heads around? I believe so. Yeah, it's it doesn't as easily play to sort of algorithmic optimization and instantaneous sort of dispatch as everyone is geared up to to be able to provide today. 
because we're, we're also used to operating in this sort of day ahead to intraday horizon. But I still think it plays fundamentally to the quality of your, your price forecasts. It's the same type of data. It's just you're looking at it over longer horizons. Yeah. What's my demand uncertainty? What's my wind uncertainty? What's my underlying fuel complex? Like what's the price of gas? Because that's going to impact the near term price of power and, and where I can expect the nearer dated products uh, to move towards. Mm. I was also thinking of things like credit lines and risk <laughs> and being able to participate in those really long trades where they, the markets can swing quite so much. It's a very different risk game to like day ahead and being able to manage that risk appropriately and price it in and have a balance book which can support it. I think ultimately it comes down to the type of discussions that your optimizer is having with with the asset owner. Mm. Um, you're going to get, as, as you have across this industry, a range of risk appetites. You know, an asset that is maybe backed more by pension money is going to have a different risk profile, yeah. for example. And I think some of these opportunities are going to be very bespoke. It's going to be a conversation around the market opportunity with an asset owner and whether or not they want to access some of that and how much of their autonomy do they want to cede as well because you know forward products are one thing but we've also you know there's there's other ways of monetizing that sort of forward value and gaining some element of revenue certainty you know right the way down to sort of tolling agreements where you basically hand the keys over to someone else and you let them take the risk and you take the payoff yeah do you see do you see more of those tolling agreements or I'm thinking with the flattening of prices and saturation hitting the, the frequency response markets, are we going to see more optimizers paying out on a floor? Do you think do you think we're at risk of getting to that this summer over um, the course of this year? I'd, I would hope not. Obviously, the market this summer has been low by comparison to the last two, three years. I think that's, <laughs> that's an understatement. <laughs> um, but it's it's in line with what we were expecting when we were making our revenue forecasts back in 2019. Yeah. And that volatility is still present in the market. Structurally, we would expect volatility to increase. You know, we're going to see, we're already seeing the retirement of coal. We're seeing aging nuclear come off of the system as well. And some of the older CCGTs are eventually going to go as well because they're not competitive. That's going to be replaced by renewables and short flexibility. Uh, and what that means is there's going to be more periods of prolonged oversupply followed by very tight periods of, of undersupply. And that's going to that's that's going to blow out the spreads that storage needs to be able to capitalize on to make the investment case. Yeah. work. The fundamentals are all there mm -hmm. um, to make us believe that we need 25 gigawatts of storage on the system. I guess it's it's quite challenging at the moment with really high interest rates and debt costing maybe 10 percent to be able to get the IRR on your battery business case to make that make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fundamentals are driving it and we, we should all sleep safe at night. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's Good. what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so coming on to what does success look like for the future of Habitat? Are you looking at new markets, uh, new geographies maybe? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, we've got some exciting news in terms of uh, we're, we're currently in three distinct geographies at the moment. So we're, our GB is our home market. GB. Uh, Australia, the NEM, National nice. Electricity Market. We're about to go live with our first uh, co-located solar and storage asset there. And then more recently uh, in ERCOT, we've just gone live with our first 60 megawatts of battery storage Amazing. there. Congratulations, Thank 60 megs. 60 megs, small, small start, but it's a very big market. And I think there's a lot of interest in, well, across the US more broadly, probably the, the two big markets to be looking at at the moment are ERCOT and Kaiso, the Californian market. We've plumped for ERCOT to begin with. Yep. And the traders uh, and data scientists there have picked one hell of a time to <laughs> to go live with our first operational assets because I was having a chat with them the other day. Uh, Texas is undergoing something called a heat dome oh. at the moment. Wow, and I think Quentin has actually been probably feeling the effects of that heat I dome. I think so, yeah, definitely shorts and t-shirts weather and a lot of AC. So unlike GB, there's a lot of cooling demand mm. there. And so when you get you get your AC in your car before you turn the car on, so that yeah. the car is you know habitable yeah. when you get there. Exactly, exactly. So um, when that that solar trough, when when the solar goes away at the end of the day, you get some real severe demand ramps there. And so I think our initial batteries are are really thrown into the thick of it and are earning some 
uh, revenues, which are sad to say is, a, is the GB market lead outperforming our RGB batteries. But I mean, that's the, I guess that's the point of having a diverse portfolio across markets, because it's not just the different type of markets that you can operate in within a single geography, but it's the different type of structures that those different geographies bring to yeah, for. obviously, ERCOT's got a completely different market set up as opposed uh, compared to GP. We've got no door pricing, much more granular uh, settlement. There's a day ahead market and then a real time market. There's no kind of intraday picture. Mm-hmm. And something like Alex will Alex will know the exact number, but a very high percentage of revenue is made on a very small number of days in ERCOT historically. That's exactly um, it. Yeah, I think it's 90% of revenue across the top 50 days yes. of the year. Yeah, or something, yeah, yeah. Something something like like that. That. And you can believe it actually seeing the revenue figures coming out of these assets just over the last week. You can absolutely understand why that's the case. I think being in these three geographies in particular sets sets us up well for any form of market reform which might come GB's way. Yep. So we're operating in Airport, we're operating nodal, nodal, we're prices. operating five minute settlement, five minute dispatch, and we're operating self dispatch in, in GB. So hopefully we're ready for whatever regulatory and market changes come our way. But in terms of success more broadly as a company, obviously the underlying revenue, being able to deliver on those revenue expectations, um, that's pretty paramount. You know, you're, we're being entrusted by an asset owner to manage a multi-million pound asset and we need to deliver on that. But I think there is a lot more to being a good optimizer than just the day-to-day uh, value maximization. So you've got to be very careful looking after these assets, making sure you don't discharge them too heavily, respect warranties, make sure temperature is maintained at a reasonable level and cycling is is exactly. appropriate. Uh, warranty management and looking after the batteries is a really big part of it, but it goes like end to end. So we operate the brownfield sites. We also operate uh, greenfield sites. So sites that are coming online, maybe undergoing site acceptance testing at the moment. And so we're advising and we can advise at every step of the way. So there's like pre-commissioning guidance, optimal warranty design in the first place. Yeah. yeah. So you know the early you know the the i guess asset owners come to you saying how much is my asset going to be cycling so that i can get the appropriate warranty and get the appropriately sized system to begin with exactly and but the the battery manufacturers the cell manufacturers in the first place didn't necessarily really know how when, when they were building their batteries and providing warranties for a largely ffr mm-hmm. world mm-hmm. they didn't know how that world was going to evolve yeah any have you seen sort of surprised i'm sure you can't tell us exactly but in some of the older assets which do have a very much ffr type warranty so one cycle a day 400 cycles a year keep within sort of 50 percent state of charge have you seen those batteries cope well or badly in an era which looks quite different. I say that thinking that DC has basically meant a lot of the fleet does essentially nothing for two years. So but now we're in kind of more of a traded, <laughs> trading I world. Mean, thankfully, there aren't any one cycle warranties in our portfolio, but we do often talk with asset owners who are looking at getting an optimal warranty and they might have um, negotiated something with the, with the cell manufacturer or the original equipment manufacturer that say, they, they come to Habitat and they say, we've got three cycles a day. That's great for you guys, right? And then we'll have a look at the warranty and we'll say, you've got three cycles a day, but actually you've got like mandated rest periods or you've got like really restrictive yeah. temperature limits. And actually what in practice, you don't have three cycles a day because another warranted parameter is going to come in and constrain you. And so being able to have those discussions really early on allows for sort of optimal warranty design. Yeah. But to your point, yeah, some of the more constraint, the sites that have got more constraining warranties you have to take that into account in your optimization decision making. So you're right, like DC is a good market for some of those sites because they, you know, in a low spread environment, they can't cycle three times a day. Mm. Uh, they're going to get capped out and one cycle a day is not going to outperform dynamic containment. So in some respects, it makes some of the optimization decision making easier. It's the assets that have got very flexible warranties that are registered for all markets they're the ones that are challenging because there are so many different ways in which you can optimize the value for that asset. And so you're looking at the opportunity cost of participating not only across all the wholesale markets, but across uh, the suite of the new suite of DFR markets, soon to be the reserve markets as well. You've got the enduring auction 
platform changes, mm -hmm. which thankfully means that we no longer have to pick winners. So I, I don't have to it think make it easier. I mean, DR, is, DR is going to be a good market for me. And then I realized that actually, you know, DR was worse than I thought. And DC was the market to be in. But I had to choose to put my volume in DR. Uh, with the enduring auction changes, we're now going to be able to place a basket of orders yeah. uh, across all of these markets. And that is from it's an sort of like the first bit of kind of central dispatch, them choosing which one yeah, well, that you go so in, essentially. The optimization algorithm and uh, insight, the, the people that are, are doing it have got a good track record of, of producing uh, quality algorithms because they also did the Euphremia algorithm, which mm. does the, uh, the day ahead market coupling. Um, you mean the one that we're no longer part of? Yes, exactly that. <laughs> So it's a sore spot, <laughs> but it, I guess having all of this, uh, having these changes to the endure, with, that come with the enduring auction capability, uh, makes picking winners a thing of the past. But it does make the optimization decision making more complex because you you are now placing baskets of orders, valuing multiple different markets, potentially valuing the stacking opportunity of multiple different markets. And whilst I don't think it's a day one thing, but National Grid have uh, intended that these markets can be, uh, these DFR markets can also be stacked in the same direction. So you could be doing uh, some element of dynamic containment with some element of dynamic regulation as well. So the optimization complexity is is getting more complex. And the operational complexity of getting all that, all those ducks in a row and actually dispatching the batteries in your 10 megawatts of DC plus 5 megawatts of DR. Exactly. With DM in the other direction. You're going to get some, yeah, yeah the, the amount of uh, the state of energy management, the envelopes that you're going to have to work within, uh, the ramp, ramp rate, rate requirements, performance yeah. requirements, performance penalties. And so all of that needs to be taken in at the point where you're bidding. Mm. Right? You need to be able to, to think, do I do I want to operate solely in one market, wholesale or DFR, or is there a benefit to stacking those services? Do I think I can outperform uh, either or by doing some combination of both? Yeah, super interesting times ahead. I can't <laughs> wait to see what all of this EAC stuff looks like on the leaderboard. It's amazing. And when we look at our kind of asset operations pages, you look a couple of years ago and assets are doing like one or two colors, one or two markets. And now a single asset can be doing five or six different markets on the same day. And that's just going to get more fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be we'll be ready for it. I think it was you guys that pointed out that our Red Scar asset did one of the most diverse trading strategies of, of last year, doing a mix of uh, m the majority of markets. Yeah. So we're looking forward to seeing what we can deliver in, in a world where there's even more opportunity. Yeah. Well, we will be we will be watching. <laughs> uh, we will nearly wrap up. I give you your opportunity, Chris, to do a plug. And then I would really like to know your contrarian view. Oh, OK. Can I have two plugs, Robin? Oh, would that be OK? Yes. I feel like I really should plug the, the Habitat optimization platform. I think Ralph, our head of business development, would probably slap me around the head if um, I didn't. So for any asset owners out there with current operational assets or, or anyone that is uh, looking to invest or is in, in the process of developing uh, battery storage or indeed renewables, uh, if you're not already speaking with us, come and have a chat and we'd be uh, really grateful to talk you through the markets as we see them and, and the Habitat offering. My, my second plug is actually one for you guys and, and uh, for your colleague Neil in uh, producing the uh, Energy Academy. Oh, very good. Um, it's such a wonderful uh, informational resource. Like every, every new, new joiner that we have at Habitat, I get them to look at the Energy Academy because you've got this just... Neil has a really great way of, of decomplexifying some quite uh, difficult issues and and turning them into bite-sized pieces. And I think it's, it's something that should be applauded and probably doesn't oh, get enough attention. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much. We'll give you some uh, Energy Academy stash oh, for the back of that. Awesome, nice awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and your contrarian view? I knew you were going to ask this one. It's a very good way to end a podcast question, I think, with uh, asking the contrarian view. Okay, so... We've talked a lot about battery skip rates. It's a very hot topic at the moment. BM utilization. Yeah, there was uh, a there was a letter from the Electricity Storage Network a couple of weeks ago. National Grid posted a response. There's been all manner of noise. We've put out a lot of <laughs> BM analysis as well in the last couple of weeks. It's a big thing at the moment. It is a big thing, and rightly so, because batteries 
should be utilized in the BM. As we've already discussed, they can do this more competitively than other tech types yep. and at a lower carbon cost. And anything which doesn't enable that uh, efficient utilization is detrimental to the investment case for storage. So it's rightly getting the attention it deserves. I think my contrarian view is that most fingers at the moment seem to be pointing to national grid and not a lot is being said about uh, the wider infrastructure, in particular, Alexon's infrastructure. Interesting. So, yeah, National Grid, I think, get the the sort of the blame quite a lot of the time for their systems. And there are system problems in the control room, which is why you see a lot of batteries and other assets being skipped. But the wider environment, so yesterday, day before last week, there was a notice in the operational forum that... Uh, there was a huge delay in mail data coming out. Mm -hmm. And obviously that is quite fundamental for traders, knowing what's going on in real time in the markets, having up-to-date information about um, maximum export limits, how much power you can you can dispatch. Um, and that that's at the fault of Alexon, not National Grid. Yes, yeah, that's the case. So I think there's a bandwidth issue mm -hmm. in terms of Alexon's ability to process all this market data. So, you know, Credit where credit's due, National Grid have listened to industry and they are reforming their systems. So I've been to a number of the flexibility forums. Uh, I've spoken to Chiho Lam, who's the chief architect for what will be the bulk dispatch optimizer. This is the one that will give smaller assets a much fairer chance. Exactly. So All of the changes they're making to like EDT, DL to health state of charge. So the, the BDO in, in there are things going on. is going to, I think, is everything that the storage industry has been asking for. Mm. It is an algorithmic solution that's going to be managed by the balancing engineers in the control room. So again, human in the loop. So it needs to be utilized by those engineers. But uh, theoretically, in this We've seen this in the demo. It should be capable of running six to eight times an hour uh, and dispatching up to 300 instructions per run. So really, if you're a storage asset and you're available, you're priced in merit and you're not in a constrained area, you should get taken. You should get taken, which will be like seismic in terms of what we see from BM revenues across the fleet at the moment. Exactly. Whether it's not going to be out until 2027 in its in <laughs> full glory. Not in full glory. I mean, at the moment, I think the addition of the BM uh, of the battery zones is considered a stretch case for them. So we're all hoping it's going to be end of this year yeah. for the inclusion of batteries. But the, the problem with this is, you know, if national national grid are, are honouring their word, they're they're making they're building the infrastructure, and you know they've got the unenviable task of having to do this whilst balancing the system twenty four seven. The lights on, yeah. So they they can't afford to take a six month outage whilst they get rid of all their legacy systems. You can't and, even and have any downtime any new tools. for like a single second. Exactly. So they have to do all of this in parallel, this um, co development. Um, but they're giving the industry what we're asking for. The problem is. If we see more efficient uh, BM dispatch of storage, we're going to see more mail and mill redeclarations. It's going to be a lot more data. A lot more data. And so just in the last couple of days, we've seen a number of market circulars saying that Alexon is struggling with this. Uh, we've had, a, you know, Habitat has had an email from National Grid on behalf of Alexon requesting us kindly to reduce the frequency of our mail and mill redeclarations. Mm -hmm. So I think... The whole industry is pointing at National Grid and improvement of their systems. And whilst there are conversations around EDL and EDT infrastructure, not a lot of people are talking about Alexon's infrastructure. And the whole market relies on it. From trader and generator to Modo here, yep. we all need that data to make yeah, accurate decisions. Well. Uh, so as a trader, what I fear is that National Grid are going to come good uh, and this is going to get deployed at year end or perhaps beginning of next year. But then the brakes are going to be put on it because Alexon's architecture is not going to be ready for the volume of data. And I hope that I'm wrong. I'm used to being wrong. I make uh, risk-based decisions for a living, so I don't mind being wrong. And I hope um, once this podcast is aired, if someone from Alexon comes to me. I'm and sure says, they'll tell us Chris, they've got you're, huge you're, mis you're, you're wrong. We're up. absolutely ready for yeah. this. Have faith. Um, I would like nothing more than that. But I fear we're going to see some delays in our 
uh, hope for a more efficient BM dispatch of storage, but it's not going to be down to National Grid. Interesting. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Uh, <laughs> leave us all something to ponder there. And anyone from Alexon, if you'd like to re reach out, we'd be very happy to hear from you to tell, tell us that Chris is indeed wrong. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. Super interesting conversation. And uh, we'll catch you soon. Oh, and if you want to, if you like what you're hearing, please like, comment and subscribe. Izzy's nodding at me. Right. <laughs> thanks very much. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you.